right, we're going to start off with a word of prayer. I'll start us off today. Father, as we come to you tonight, we just are grateful for your presence, your goodness, your faithfulness to us. Uh, I bow my heart and my mind and literally my entire being before you at your throne. I, I pray that tonight that what we say, what we do, what we discuss, the questions, everything, Lord, would be honoring to you that you would be glorified in our lives and build us up, Lord Jesus. I pray that you would exhort us and encourage us through your word and just through uh, what's said here tonight. Be with each one of these men and women and just deepen their love for you, their relationship to you, deepen their affection for your word. Um, we are all very fragile, very feeble at times, and can become confused if we're not careful. So it's really important, Father, that uh, we, we learn, that we grow the grace and knowledge and wisdom uh, so that we can be, and so that we can become what you want us to become. We love you deeply. And we, Commit ourselves to you now in Christ's name. Amen. Excuse me, give us a minute for just a second. Continue tonight with uh, cultivating the pastor's heart. I want to say that um, we'll finish. I hope that we'll finish this section up. I've only got two or three pages, but sometimes it takes me that long to get through it. Uh, and then we're going to do the last one for this semester is uh, not lording over your flock. And I will not be able. To, I've got. I've given that to you in the handout, and I, I obviously will not be able to. Um, complete that um, uh, this week and next week. I don't think, not unless I talk fast. <laughs> I'm never in a hurry, really. <laughs> so I'd rather just slow down and just enjoy what we're doing here. We uh, are talking about uh, cultivating a, a pastor's heart. You've got to have an unquenchable love for God, for His Word, for His people. Uh, just different things that have to be a part of your life and and uh, you, you can't just go off and hide yourself in your ministerial man cave, right? There, there are plenty of pastors that do that. I don't know what, what your pastor's like, but I know one of the larger churches in Aiken that the guy would, the pastor would come to church and, and uh, I kind of talked to several of his staff members and each one of them said, well, he would just come there and he would just go into this room and lock it. I mean, the door and lock it. And, and uh, you just didn't really have much interaction with, with people. Yeah, I don't think you can do that, I mean, if you're a pastor. I mean, you have to build relationships, especially with your staff people. I mean, that, that can be trouble, trust me. I mean, staff people can be trouble. Um, so you, you have to always see your life and the ministry to which God called you as one in which you're on a continual learning curve, right? You're on a continual learning curve. I mean, this is just ought to be common sense to all of us. It's, it's a continual, never-ending journey of spiritual growth. You're growing in your, relation, your personal relationship to God. You're growing in your relationship to your family, to your wife or husband. You're growing in relationship to the members of your church. You're, you're growing in relationship to your staff people, if you have any. Uh, 
you're, you're growing in your relationship to lost people and how you're going to minister to them, how you're going to reach out and touch their lives. It, it, it's, it's never ending. It never stops. It, it just never ends. Nor should it. I, I like that part of it. I, I like the part that there's, there's always uh, people that God brings into your life um, it, 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 it's that's the fun part of it, you know, to have new people come in, and uh, so you're you're always developing a love for the lost. If you don't have a love for the lost, uh, there's probably not a whole lot of reason to be to be uh, in the ministry at all. Um, you know, lost people they they need a shepherd. They really need a shepherd. They 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 don't have anybody to lead them. They don't have they, they, they don't have any markers as to where their life is going. Uh, we went into a restaurant this past Sunday, and uh, it was really interesting to me the distinct cultural. Um, change that's taking place in restaurants with people that wait on you and, and, and the lifestyle that they have. It's, it's, they got the colors on, they, they got it in their hair, they got the rainbows, they, they've got their fingernails painted. Um, uh, it, it's just, you know, I, I, my heart is, I, I just, Rather than feeling awkward about it, I just kind of hurt for for him, you know. I, I, I know that they're they're headed down the wrong road, and uh, just being able to find an opportunity where you can talk to people that you know are just headed in the exact opposite direction of you is it, not an easy task. It, it's not an easy task. Jesus did it well. <laughs> I mean, he did it well. He said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to come down and go to your house tonight. You know, everybody hated tax collectors, right? We talked about that Sunday. Everybody hated tax collectors. I mean, if you uh, have watched any of The Chosen, uh, they have uh, some scenes in there where, where uh, Matt, you know, where Matthew gets called. Uh, or whoever it was. I don't know. Matthew. Matthew, he gets called, you know, and He's afraid to kind of go out <laughs> until he gets to his little booth there where he's protected and they got some Roman guards uh, hanging around there. Uh, but, you know, they're just people wandering around in the world. They, they really have no hope. Uh, they, they have no foundation for what they're doing. Uh, they don't know what they are. They don't know how to define what they are. I heard a, I saw something on Facebook that I thought was kind of interesting where it said, you had 10 men, 10 men and 100 women and you put them on an island after so many years, you, you, you would have a, a growing community, you know, a really growing community or something like that. And, but if you took 100 men and, and uh, uh, the other, you know, whatever it was, whatever it is, I, I don't want to get taken off of off of this YouTube, uh, after a couple of generations, all, all you would have would be the dead bones of 110 men. That, that, that's all you could have, you know. It's like so. But those people are, are just as important as we are. They have just as much value in God's sight, and developing a love for the lost is. Just as important as de developing a love for your own people in your own church, you know, and how you're going to reach them and all that kind of stuff. Uh, James and Cindy, they're not here, they'll be here in a little bit, but um, they go out uh, to a U Health uh, MCG and they just hand out Bibles. Uh, they have the Gideon Bibles, they're not Gideons, but the Gideons give them Bibles to go hand out and it's amazing. I think they've given out about 60 so far, haven't they? And uh, I'm getting some cards made for them so that they can just give, give them cards, uh, you know, to say, hey, look, if you need some help, um, you know, uh, 
just, just call us at our church. I had a really interesting uh, encounter on Sunday after church. Uh, we, we ate and it was a little late when we got through and I had to go pick up some medicine and then I went to Lowe's to get uh, something for my roof. And, and I was kind of in the back and there was this lady that came up beside me and she was a, she obviously was not in there to buy anything. She just wasn't there to buy anything. Um, uh, she was looking for a handout. And uh, I mean, she was uh, kind of a very big woman. Her teeth just looked terrible. Um, uh, and uh, so I'm sitting there. I'm, I'm talking in church about how to encourage people in their life, you know, whoever they may be. And uh, I'm sitting there and I'm, I have a suit on and I look a lot different than she does. And she asked me, she says, do you have $20 that I can have? And she said, I have, uh, uh, I have to get a part for my car before I can get home. I didn't know where she was going to get the part, but uh, I figured that she was just looking for a handout, whatever it was, and she asked her where she lived and what her name was and stuff, and I asked her, I said, is this legit, you know, and, but uh, the whole time I just tried to kind of smile at her, you know, not be condemning, not look down on her and stuff, and I began to share with her, and and she says, she could tell that I had probably been to church. And she said, well, where do, you, where do you go to church? And I said, well, I go to Chimeville Baptist Church. And she says, I know where that is. She says, that's down off of Chimeville Road, off of Whiskey Road. And I said, yes, ma'am, it is. And uh, we, we kept talking and uh, it, it just sort of came out. I said, I told her, I said, well, I'm, I'm the pastor there. I've been there for a long time. And uh, I said, uh, I shared a little bit with her. And I, I said, do you mind if I pray with you? Do you, do you mind if I just, do you mind if we, uh, we're just here in the store, just two of us back here. Do you, do you mind if I just pray with you and take a little bit of time and just ask God to help you? I said, obviously, you know, she was giving me her story and her husband and why they were where they were and this and that and all those kind of things. And... Uh, so I just, uh, I began to pray for her. And I could tell that while I was praying that she was crying, and that she was weeping. And when I finished my prayer, I looked up and she just had tears rolling down her face, you know. And I said, uh, uh, I, said I tried to be a little careful without being arrogant about it, but, you know, if you, uh, you know where our church is. You know, people are important. People are just important, and they may not be like us, right? They may not look like us. I gave her the twenty dollars. That was all I had. I said, "You're very fortunate because I normally pay everything by, <laughs> yeah. by, by uh, uh, plastic, and and uh, and I, I normally don't even have cash on me. I don't have any on me now." And uh, so I just, I, I gave her the $20 and, and uh, she just started crying again, started weeping. She's hurting on the inside. She knows where her life is. She knows where she is. She knows whether or not what she was telling me was the truth. And I was trying to love her in a way that Jesus would love Zacchaeus or blind Bartimaeus or the woman taken in adultery or the woman at the well or whoever it was, rather than being the Pharisee uh, that walked by and the Sadducee that walked by and the Levite that walked by, uh, the guy that was beaten up on the road. Right? I mean, I can be either one. I can go out of there with my nice suit on and 
she'd just be back there and, uh, and I'm, not, I'm not offering any kind of help to her. Uh, and I mean, people are just wandering around, they have no hope, they don't, they don't know what hope is, they don't even know where they're going. And in reality, uh, you, you cannot lose sight in your ministry of what is eternal. You have to be growing in that. You have to be growing in that part of your life and in that part of your ministry. Um, families are, in, are eternal. Uh, not some program you're obsessed with beginning in your church, right? People are, are what's important. And the way that God reaches people is through what? People. Other people, right? My church is well trained in that, right? <laughs> you know, you reach people through people. Uh, you, you talk to people. You, you, you cannot fall in love with the ministry. I would say it this way. What you want to do is fall in love with people. All kinds of people. Just fall in love with them. Just care for them. Whether it's the waitress at the table... Uh, we, we ate at uh, Russell's Pizza tonight, they have really good pizza, <laughs> in Williston, and uh, we got the cheese and pepperoni, medium, still couldn't eat all of it, and I ate three pieces, and my wife ate three pieces, but for the last uh, three times that we've been there, uh, before class, this one big, tall, African-American brother waits on us. He's very nice. He, he's really <laughs> nice. He comes out, he's got four plates. He says, I'm, I'm going to give you some more plates because other people have touched these on the top and some people don't like that. I mean, he's just nice he could be. I had a long conversation with him the last time that we were there. I said, brother, I said, you ever played basketball? Him, he must be about 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six or something. And he said, yeah, I used to play basketball. And I said, well, uh, I bet you could still play really good, you know. And just really, really big guy. But he was extremely nice. And I, and I think he remembered me tonight from two weeks ago or whenever it was that we were there and in the time before that because I, I tried to talk to him. Uh, you just have to fall in love with people, and it has to be to such an extent that they know that you love them and that you're there for them. In the pastorate, you got to write this down, in the pastorate, nothing can take the place of caring for people. Nothing can take the place of caring for people. Uh, people hurt. People have families that are hurting them. Uh, lost children. Uh, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, people have are losing marriage partners to cancer or whatever it may be, you know. And uh, if you were to ask the average church member what meant more to them regarding their pastor, I, I wonder which one you think it would be. Would it be that they wanted a great preacher or a great pastor? I'm going to tell you that probably 95% of the people are going to tell you that they'd rather have a great pastor than a great preacher. That's what they're going to tell you. They, 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 they're going to tell you that they'd rather have a great pastor than a great preacher, somebody that they knew cared about them. I want to ask you a really simple question, so please do not miss the significance of this question. But having said all of that, which is more important to you? Would you rather be a great preacher or would you rather be a great pastor? Right? I mean, which one do you want to be? Because whatever, however you answer that question, that's going to dictate the direction of your ministry. It's going to dictate whether or not you are even able to cultivate a pastor's heart. Some people are just cultivating a preacher's mindset and a preacher's heart. But you want to cultivate a pastor's heart. I think that's a non-negotiable. Uh, I would choose being a great pastor every day of the week, every every day of the year. I, I want I, I want the legacy of the time that I spend at my church, uh, so far 28 years, uh, successfully, you know, that when I uh, have to retire or when my health just uh, uh, gives out, 
that the legacy that I leave to my people is that they're going to say, they, they would say to somebody else, he was a great pastor. I don't care if they say that he was a, a great preacher. I would rather them say he was a great pastor. That's the legacy that I would rather, that I would rather leave for them, that they love their pastor, not that they love their preacher. I, I, I know that some, there, there may not be much of a distinction, but I think to uh, a lot of men that stand in the pulpit each week, they want to be a great preacher. They, they, they just want people to fall out when, they, when they're preaching, you know, and, and uh, all that kind of stuff, and just keep people spellbound with their sermons, and to be the preacher who drew the large crowds, and all of that kind of stuff, and walk around on the stage without a Bible, and you know, got, got on their t-shirts and show off their muscles and all that kind of stuff. I just can't imagine Jesus doing that for some reason. I mean, he may not dress up in a suit. It's not actually a suit. This is a sports jacket, right? <laughs> they call him a blazer. Yeah. I think that's what they call him. Um, but they cared more about their pulpit persona than they cared about their people. Listen. Listen to me very carefully. If you will love your people, you can be assured that they will love your preaching. If you'll just love your people, they will love what you teach them. They will love the preaching that you, they, they, they'll let you spank them. I can say it that way. They, they will let you discipline them and say things that, that uh, you know, they, other, other men would not be able to say. Because, why? Because they know that you care about them. They, they know that you really actually love them. Uh, your, your children know that you love them. And there's sometimes where you have to, where you have to discipline them, right? And uh, it's just part of being a parent. And, but they, know, they still know that you love them and that you care about them. And that's what makes it effective. Uh, you have to have a, a, a shepherd's heart. And that's something that you clearly have to develop. There, there's no amount of seminary training that can give that to you. I don't care how many classes you take here. It's just kind of on-the-job training. I mean, you have to get there. You, you, you have to be there. You have to be with people. You have to go through all of the problems that they have and the weddings and the funerals and uh, the, uh, the babies that didn't live and this and that and the children that are rebellious and the car wrecks that happened and, and everything. I mean, you got to go through all of it and you, you have to care about those, about those people. And, and the seminary it cannot train you for that. E either you want it or you do not. And if you don't want it, then you must develop it in your life. And if you're not willing to do that, I would encourage you to do something else. It's just really a very simple formula. You can't be successful as, uh, as a pastor of a church if you don't have a pastor's heart, right? I mean, that only makes sense. It's just common sense. It's just, uh, you know, divine common sense on our part. That if, if, if you don't, if, 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 if you don't develop a pastor's heart, you, you, you can't be a pastor. Now, I want to share with you what I think is going to be the problem that you're going to face. This is going to sound a little crazy here, but people can be kind of messy at times. People can be kind of messy at times. And uh, there are certain churches that have messy people in them. <laughs> You know, um, people that are argumentative, people that want their way, people that are never satisfied, people that have to have to vote on everything. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, let me see here. Um, and uh, in any congregation, you can easily have the full range of different kinds of people. You can have kind people and hard to get along with people, you know, people that are hard to get along with. Uh, you can have spiritual people, you can have divisive people, you can have sheep, you can have goats, 
You're going to have wheat, you're going to have tares, you're going to have good fish, you're going to have bad fish. You're going to have disciples, you're going to have people who don't have a clue what a disciple even is. They're going to be in every church. You can, you can have messy people, right? It's just, it's really that, that simple. Hey, Rob. Hey, here. <laughs> um, I've heard it said, um, I mean, you, you, you can have people that love you and people that do not like you at all. And when people do not like you, you know what they're going to do? Come on, somebody tell me the answer. What are they going to do when they don't like you? They're going to... Gossip. Huh? Cause trouble, cause drama. They, they, they're going to cause drama. They're going to talk about you. They're going to push back on everything you do. Right, they're going to talk, talk behind your back. That's just the way it works. That's just the way it works. Um... Uh, uh, I've heard it said about church life that very often the enemy is within, and I think that's very true. People that you thought that you could trust with your confidence can be persuaded otherwise by troublemakers. Because they know they're going to be there. They know that you may not be there. And they're going to side with the people that they believe are going to stay there, and they can cause trouble, and uh, they will betray you. They'll go around behind your back and talk to other people about your faults, and uh, when they do not like something that you are doing, this is very normal. Very normal in most church cultures, okay? Not, not, not every church is going to be like this. Um, but I, I still think it's very normal. It's, it's very normal. Churches split very often. There's a reason that churches split very often. I've been at my church for 28 years and we've never had a church split. We've had some people split, which were a good thing, but not necessarily any kind of church split. Uh, so I think this is normal. I think it should actually be ex expected, and trust me when I say this, but it does not take much effort on your part to actually disappoint people. This doesn't take much effort at all. I mean, just one thing. Just one decision that you make, one 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 thing that you may say in the in the pulpit, you know, and the next thing you know, people are just, you know, they're like this. They they, they don't they don't care for you anymore. They don't they, they don't like you anymore. Uh, you you can do your best. You can try to be the best pastor you could possibly be, and still disappoint people no matter how hard you try. This is ministry. This is life after the preaching service is finished. <laughs> right. The preaching service may be, you may preach for an hour. I preached for an hour and 15 minutes this week. I'm doing better. <laughs> Remember my church. I'm working. I'm getting it down. But after we leave, after you leave the preaching service, it's when all the buzz starts, right? Uh, it's when people talk, when people, you know, sort of communicate what they want, what they don't want, what they like, what they don't like. This is church life. One, one author said, I, I love this, uh, uh, this guy, uh, uh, Burns, he said, he said that exercising leadership might be understood as disappointing people at a rate that they can absorb. <laughs> can you repeat that again, please? Exercising leadership might be understood as disappointing people at a rate they can absorb. I thought that was, I thought that was pretty accurate insight. You know, uh, you just kind of got to disappoint them slowly. <laughs> if I can say it that way. Oswald Sanders, uh, he wrote his classical book called Spiritual Leadership. It has a chapter called The Cost of Leadership. You ought, to, you ought to go back and read it. 
It's, uh, I think, I think we probably had that as a, as a text in one of these courses. And one thing that he said that was that anyone who truly aspires to a position of leadership in God's kingdom must be, this is, this is what he said, must be willing to pay a price higher than others are willing to, to pay. So if you really aspire to a position of leadership in the church, then you're going to have to pay a price that's higher than what everybody else is willing to pay. I think that's very accurate. He goes on to say that the toll of true leadership is heavy, and the more effective the leadership, the greater the cost. There's some people that just don't want to change, right? I, I, I told you the, the story about the lady that asked our visitors to get out of her seat at, at, at church one day. Now, we're a small church. We have about nine or ten rows, and, and probably only seat five on each row. We probably get 90 in there if, at, at the max, and, and she's running people off, you know, telling them, get out of my seat. You know, that's my seat. And, uh, and, it, and, uh, uh, Mr. Sanders used the example of when Jesus stood before his, his demoralized band of disciples after his resurrection, and he showed them both his hands and his feet. That was the cost. That was the cost. Here, just look at my hands. You know, you know yeah, I'll show you what's, I'll show you my side if you want to. And so the scars of ministry that you that you are going to inevitably receive in the ministry, the, the, the scars of ministry that you're going to inevitably receive will help authenticate where you are in your ministry. Everybody understand what I just said? Uh, uh, they will validate somebody who has become uh, a, a, an actual spiritual leader. The very hallmark of the life of Jesus Christ himself was that he constantly suffered. He constantly suffered. You go back, read Isaiah 53. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. You know, everywhere he went, People hated him. He, he would raise somebody from the dead. They'd take counsel how they could kill him. Uh, you know, Pilate says, I was reading this morning in Luke about uh, Christ, and uh, Pilate says, I, 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 just, I don't find any fault in him at all. You know, he sends him off to uh, the other guy. What was his name? Herod. Herod, and, and he didn't find any fault. He said, I wanted him to do some kind of, he said, I, I was really kind of, interested in him. He said, I want to see him do a miracle. And Jesus never even talked to him, never said a word. And he sent him back to Pilate and Pilate said, I don't see any, I don't see any fault in this man. And everybody else said, what? Crucified. 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 Killed him. That was the ministry that God had given to him. Here was the most, here's the perfect example of what it means to suffer. What Jesus did. Isaiah 53 says, He's despised, uh, 53 3, He's despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. So if you're ever going to have a pastor's heart, then you must appreciate that there will be many times when you may not have a clue as to how God is using really difficult people and very troubling circumstances in your life. Just not have a clue. But you have to let him do that, right? You have to yield yourself to God's sovereignty over your life and over your ministry. Let him bring in the, 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 the disgruntled people, whatever it is we're, we're going to talk about uh, in the next, in this next section, uh, not boarding over your flock. Uh, we won't get through with it next week, but you can finish up the notes. And um, about, about well, how do you handle that? You know, how do you handle it when people come in and, and are not 
are not pretty. Um, there be many times uh, when, when people are going to be very difficult. They're going to create a lot of stress on your life. If you don't believe me, you're naive. You're naive. Uh, and it doesn't take much for that to happen. Uh, you cannot avoid difficult people or stressful moments. It's, it's, it's just not realistic. The enemy is always sowing tares into your field of wheat. Always. Always. If he can't get to you, he'll get somebody else, right? He's got a tactic. He's got a methodology that he's, he's not afraid to use. Uh, if he can't get to you, he can get to somebody else. It could be anybody. It could be anybody in your church. It, it could be those that are the closest to you in your church. Uh, it could be a family member. It, it could be children. It could be anything. Can the, can the tears ever become wheat, or will they always be the tears? There will always be tears. No matter they, what. They, they, are not, they are not wheat. In, in, I mean, in a physical sense. Mm -hmm. they, they just don't have the germination to, to become wheat. So no matter... You don't, I guess, know really who they are. It would be an exercise in futility for you to try to change those people. Well, I, I think, not really. Um, I think that's my job. It, I don't know who God's going to save and who, who He's not. My job is to be faithful with the Word and teach it and preach it accurately and evangelize as appropriate, you know. But you might think somebody's a tear and they're not a tear. Yeah, I'm sure I've made mistakes before. I'm sure I've identified the wrong, <laughs> you know, and they, they begin to grow and that kind of stuff. But uh, it, it's, but you know, Jesus, Jesus talked about that in, uh, uh, I guess it was Matthew 25. He said, just let the, just let the tares grow with the wheat until I come. You know, just let them be there. Uh, but they they can cause a lot of problems. Our uh, Christians can cause a lot of problems. Trust me, <laughs> if they don't get their way. And so you have to know that, and you, you have to trust God. Trust that God knows that as well. I think the reality of the struggles that you may face is that, for the most part. Uh, that you will never know the value of those struggles or the value of those difficult people and those difficult moments except over time. It, it just takes time. And you, you'll look back and you can say, you, you'll realize how God worked in your life to make you a better pastor through having some difficult people in your congregation. It really gives you a chance to be on display as to what it means to grow and to mature and to be faithful and to handle difficult things appropriately. Uh, I'm very fortunate in my church. I just don't have any of that. And um, I mean, we, just, we don't. I mean, we, we certainly have had people come that didn't like me or my preaching, whatever it might be. But, um, it's okay, you know. I, I'm I'm way past that in my life right now. I, I love my church, and I want to be faithful to them. Um, uh, you may want to ask me. You you may you may want to you may say, how long is that time? You know, how long is that going to take? Well, that's the million dollar question, right? How long does it take you to learn a lesson? Yeah, that's right. That's right. It, 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 it could be a long time. In my mind, it can actually be years. It, it, it can be years having to deal with difficult people and know how to sort of handle them. Uh, I, I can't.
can't tell you how long it will take, but I, I can tell you, I think, with a great deal of assurance that you're going to have to go through those periods of time in your church. They're unavoidable. They're unavoidable, especially, especially if it's your first church. And hopefully your first church is your last church. Uh, I, I, I better stop with that. Y'all you know, heard me pound that drum a lot. Uh, one of the most painful lessons that any of us will ever have to learn could be considered, I think, a paradigm shift in our thinking. I think it's a, a very simple and profound lesson at the same time. We want God to work mightily through us. That's what we want. We, 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 we have a picture, we have a vision of what we think we want God to do in our life. We want, we want God to work very powerfully in our life. But God wants to first work in us. And that takes time. That's, that's the time frame is how long, how much of your life are you going to, to, to yield to God when the difficult moments and the difficult people enter in? Uh, uh, God may one day work mightily through you, you know? Uh, I don't know how to, I, I would not know how if you asked me, well, what does it mean for God to work mightily through me? I have no idea how to answer that question. I, I cannot tell you, I, I couldn't, I don't have a clue how to answer that. But we have this vision, this mindset that this is what we want God to do. But God's thinking the other way. I say he is, but I act like I know what he's thinking. <laughs> but I, I, I believe that God wants to work in you first. And I think, I think that happens on the job, right? I think some of it can happen here in the classroom, but I think the majority of it has got to happen on the job. Uh, you know, for those of you that don't, uh, that are they're young and, and still, you, you know, want to go into the ministry, um, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm never going to tell you not to take a church. Uh, I would, I would encourage you to find. Uh, a church where you can be an associate pastor first and just learn some lessons and just sit and learn. But God knows that until he can work his character and his wisdom in, in, into us that he will not really be able to work through us that much. It, it may be a little bit, but not much. I want to say something to you. You may find this to be awkward, but I, I think it's true for me personally that my my character development is a lot more important to me than my church development. My own personal character development is more important to me than my church development. Because I can never be, I can never have meaningful church development if I'm not a man of character and integrity. Uh, I have to. I have to be a man of integrity before God can actually use me, or before He can use you. We. I think we all have to understand that we learn much more from failure than we do through success. You know, failure is a great teacher. It, it really is a wonderful teacher uh, to fail. Uh, but the average person certainly. Uh, does not see it that way when failure is actually taking place in, in their life or in their ministry. They don't, they don't see it that way. But I can, I can sit here for the rest of the night and the next class and talk, talk about all the ways that I have failed in the ministry and how I have learned through it in the next, in the next study that we'll get to here in just a little bit. I will share some of my, my failures with you. Uh, I, I, I promise you that you will start out in the ministry with what we often call being gung-ho. Everybody knows what gung-ho is, you know, the guys that go in the army and they're gung-ho and they can't hardly wait to get there and get the head shaved and I never ever forget 
about the guys that were gung-ho gung to go into the Rangers. I think it was the Rangers down at Fort Benning. Is that where they trained the Rangers? <laughs> Man, it was, a, it was spooky, <laughs> the things that they got those guys to do, to weed out. And they had a little saying. I mean, they had a little sentence. I think I mentioned this to you before. That all you had to say was, I'm done, or something like that. And you were out of that. You, you, you were just going to go back into the regular army. And they started out with like 400 people, and they were only looking for 30. And I'm not even sure they got 30 people. The exercises that they put them through were, and all these guys were gung ho. I mean, they, they're big, they're rough, they're tough. And then they get them up at about 80 feet over water, walking on a beam that's about that wide. The wind's blowing. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir, not me. I, I'm done. You know, it was that kind of thing. Have, have, have you ever watched any of those? I've watched them, yeah. yeah okay. I, you know, you could tell it was in Georgia because all the pine trees. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what gung-ho actually means, but I think it means that we think we have all of something figured out, when in reality we have virtually nothing figured out. I think that's what it means. You know, we're really gung-ho for Jesus and, we, and the ministry. And we think we've got it all figured out and what it means to be a pastor. We don't have anything figured out. It takes on-the-job training. We're energetic, we're excited, we're ready to get it on, but then church life just happens, ministry failure happens. And there we are just wondering in a kind of spiritual desperation as to what in the world went wrong. You know, we're just kind of looking around, asking questions about what went wrong? Where did I fail? I mean, what, you know, what happened here? I was, you know, I, I, really, I was really energetic about this place, and now I'm, I, can't, I can't stand it. I'm ready to leave. I'm ready to go. I don't think I can take another week of preaching to these stinking people. You think I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. Not. That's why the average stay in a Baptist church is actually less than two years for most people. Uh, so we had great intentions and we were determined and we were sincere. We had big plans. We even thought we knew what we needed to know. And then something unexpected happened to us and we were off course before we ever got on the course right <laughs> we're going to the race and and we run off the road before we get to the race something happens somebody says something somebody does something somebody mistreats you mistreats your wife mistreats your children or whatever it may be we went to a deacon's meeting that did not go as we had hoped, and in the meetings, some things were said that we were not expecting to be said, you know, and then we become hurt, and we become disillusioned, and we, we, we begin to regret that we made this decision, Lord, am I in the right place, do you want me to be somewhere else? Well, yeah, I do, I want you to be right here. I want you to go through this test so you can learn something. I want you to experience this difficult moment. That was at Chime Bell? No, no, I'm just saying for anybody. Oh, oh. I'm just saying for anybody. I mean, that's the idea that you had. You, you, you go to a deacon's meeting and it didn't go like you thought it was going to go. You know, and you got disillusioned and you got hurt and... You were sincere, but you didn't think anybody else was, and blah, blah, blah. It, you know, you just lose your way. I never had one course in the seminary that helped me to understand what to do with a, a bunch of disgruntled deacons. I never had one course that said, okay, this is what you do. With a bunch of knotheads that don't seem to have an ounce of spiritual life within them. You know, that's probably not a good thing to say in a course. But it happens. And the worst part about it is, is that it's a popularity contest. In most Baptist churches, 
they vote on the deacons, and there's a turnover every two or three years. So you're going to get everybody before it's over with. You're going to get the good, the bad, and the ugly, and sometimes you can get all the ugly at the same time. You know? Uh, that's not what you're really looking for. You have a group of disgruntled deacons who think that they own the church and they need, they need to control the pastor. Sometimes he's just going to have to let them do their thing for a little bit. I, I mean, I think that's just what has to happen. <coughs> uh, this is real life being taught to you in a classroom, in a, in, in a, in a seminary setting. This is, this is ministry. This is what happens, and this is why you have to cultivate a pastor's heart. This is why you have to love God and His Word. You have to love God's calling on your life, on the work that He's called you to. This is why you have to love people. Because you have to have something that's greater than you that's going to push you through those difficult moments in, in your life and in your ministry. Even the ones that are difficult and grumpy and critical of you personally. Never forget those three steps. They, they are what you build on and build from. Now, I want to I uh, close this out here with, with a, one last paragraph. I want to encourage you to not let the ministry discourage you. All right? That's a big... After having said everything, <laughs> you haven't done anything over here. This is stupid. That you would say that. But please do not let the ministry discourage you. I know that sounds simple enough, but if you actually know that it can, and if you actually know that it will, right? If, if, if you know that that can happen, and if you are, are realistic, to appreciate that it will happen, uh, then you're much better prepared to handle it when it actually happens to you. There's a lot of research that seems to indicate that the love affair that pastors have with the church begin to seriously wane in the second year of their ministry. I think that's a really, really interesting you know, they go there with, with this vision, you know, they're, they're going to cast a vision for their church, and, but there's nobody there that, that really gives a hoot about their vision for the church. They don't care about it at all. They're not, they're not interested in their vision yet. They don't even know if they can trust you. They don't want to necessarily trust you yet. And, and next thing you know, you, you begin to get this this uh, this 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 this, this uh, kind of love affair you have with your church in the beginning, your your love for it begins to wane a little bit, and if you make it to the third year, you you're just convinced that it's not going to work, and you need to move on. That's the average. That's the average mentality. That's what the statistics actually communicate to us. That's when reality sets in and that people start feeling desperate to change things. Church is not going anywhere. It's not doing what you want it to do. And so you lose your perspective and you, you try to force the issues. You try to make it happen. That's really, really a very, very bad, very uh, 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 wrong perspective to actually take place. You're, 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 the, the real perspective is, is that you want is that nobody's going to listen to me to begin with. <laughs> nobody's going to change to begin with after my, after my first year being there. You know, we had a catfish stew with the men. Boy, I thought it was going to be great. And I thought they'd just really fall in love with me. They didn't. You know, half of them didn't like catfish or something. Who knows? See. So the reality is, yes. you could go to, God could call you to a church, and you get there, and you're faithful, and you do everything the way you believe God would have you to do it. You're faithful in ministry to the people, and everybody there hates you right. for the entire, however long you're there. You could be there 20 or 30 years, and people are just <clears throat> no. not going to like you. No, I wouldn't say that. 
I, I, and, I, and, I, and, and I wouldn't say that people are going to hate you. I'm going to say there's, there's a few bad fish in the, in, in the pond and there's some tears on, on the road, you know. Um, and there's some goats sitting out there among the sheep. Um, if you'll be faithful to what God's called you, your people are going to love you. But they're not going to do it after the first year. That's the point. Is that if you don't have any endurance and if you haven't developed any perseverance, they know that. They'll sense that because you'll get you you you'll become frustrated and you'll begin to sort of push things that you probably don't need to push. Well you probably just need to keep teaching really good sermons. I've said it over and over, you, you've got to hear me. It takes at least five years for your church to trust you. Five years. Some church may be four, some may be six. Some may be ten, some may be three, I don't know. But I think the average would be five years. That's a long time to be somewhere before you really feel like you can become effective. But I think it's true. I think it's really, really true. Especially if you're in a community where nobody knows you. They, they don't know you. You know, you, you can go bouncing off to some other state, and next thing you know, you, 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 you got to go home to mama because you just, you just didn't have the endurance and the perseverance to work through that. Churches are, that's our word, messy. Churches can be very messy at times. Politics? Would you, can you call it politics in church? Sure, there are a lot of, sure, there are a lot of politics in church. Uh, there's a lot of power struggles that go on in, in churches, and they don't want you to have the power. And I, I, I would say to you, James, just to comment on that, is give them the power. Give them what they want. If that's what they want, if they, if they, if they have to have it that way, you just keep doing what God's called you to do. Because you cannot change them. Uh, only the Word of God is going to change them. You, you just have to accept it. That's the way it is. I'm going to keep preaching. Uh, there are, in every church, especially in big churches, there, there are extreme, extreme power struggles that go on. You know, It's normally among the wealthy. The wealthy, he, uh, Chris always says, you got to follow the money, right? And that's true in, in churches. Jesus spoke more highly of the widow that only gave two months. I think of what you said, that God can remove the, the he, bad apples. He will. I, I'm going to do that in the next study. We'll talk about that if we get through with it next week. Uh, but... If you just give God time, He will get rid of the the, 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 the people that He wants to, that's hindering His church. Some of them will die. Some of them will get disgruntled and leave. You know, some of them will get saved. Uh, but God has His methods, and you just have to let Him do what He does best. So. Uh, I, I think uh, I, I, I've said it before. I'm going to say it again tonight. I think a, a, a lot of young men that are going, a, a lot of men that are going into the ministry are too young to do so. They don't have enough life experience to, uh, to draw from, and, and they don't. I, I didn't. I, I, I'll put it that way. I didn't. And uh, man, I you know I've been to the seminary and. I, I thought, man, I, I was gung ho, you know, but and I didn't know squat about 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 different things. So the result is that when they don't have the patience and they don't have the endurance to stay somewhere, they just go somewhere else. Well, nothing changes in that scenario. There, there, there's nothing that changes. They still have to go through. The break-in period, the love affair, you know, 
difficulties. The difficulties, the difficult people, the difficult circumstances. And if you just keep doing that, you never learn anything. And by the time you, you know, so many years have gone by, you're about as discouraged as you can be to even be in the ministry. So you're, you're much better off if you'll just stay where you are, just let God take care of you, just do your part, be faithful to it. Uh, you know, people are always looking for that proverbial grass that they think is greener somewhere else. That's a complete illusion. I think it's a demonic mirage, right? It's just kind of demonic. If I can say it that way, if you think, well, they got a bigger church, they they, they got nicer a nicer building, all that all that kind of stuff. Some of the best churches that I've ever been in were under trees. I have some pictures of no building, no bathroom, no air conditioning for to mess with the thing, the thermostat. <laughs> and they built these hard seats with no back, and the place is packed. Or I've taught under a tree for almost eight hours a day in 110 degree weather and hardly anybody moves no food very little water and I, I couldn't I, I remember when I was up in the Philippines I mean in uh, Indonesia up in the mountains and I probably had I have pictures of it I'll show it to you sometime I remember getting off the helicopter I don't know if I ever told you this I think my church I'm told that of it. I get off the helicopter. It's me and Eddie. And they come over there and grab us and put us on their shoulders. I think they're taking me to a pot somewhere. It's <laughs> boiling. You know? I mean, really, they, they're hooping and hollering, and man, we got some fresh meat here. <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. And, uh, but we went up to a place. And they wanted, and I, I, I preached that day to them, and there were about 500 people out there. And I preached, and I would just say something, and just spontaneously, the people would respond. Just spontaneously, there was no. It was just like, it was just like everybody would just. They, they were sitting down on the ground. There was no building. There, there was nothing. Uh, <coughs> you, you can be looking for that grass that's greener on the other side. And what you will do in the process is that you will literally lose years of ministry off of your life. You, can tr you may not trust me on that, but you will after the years have gone by. What do you mean by that? Huh? I mean that you're always moving around. You you you've always got to have another church, a bigger church, a better church. A church put out so many problems and all that kind of stuff. Going backwards. And you, you're going backwards, right? You never you never learn your lesson. That's that's why you're <coughs> there. You know, that's what God's doing in you. Is that God's? Remember what we said earlier. God's God's working in you before He can work through you. And most most young pastors don't get it. I just don't get it. I didn't get it. I'm just telling you, I didn't get it. I learned the hard way. And uh, but I, I'm I'm grateful. I, I learned my lesson. And so when I went to Chime I said I told him I said this is going to be the only church I ever pastor. You know, for better or for worse. <laughs> and uh, it's been mostly ninety nine percent better. Now, more. would you say that with that perspective? Of going to a church and staying at a church. That nine times out of ten is the pastor that decides to leave, not the church asking the pastor to leave. Well, uh, I think that's normally what happens, but there are a lot of churches that don't mind firing their pastors. Under that case, you need to leave. I mean, that's, you would find all that out in your interview process with the church before, before you go to the church. How long uh, their pastors have stayed, why their pastors have left. That's you may not get a good, clean answer on that. Mm -hmm. 
The only way you could do that is get a list of the pastors and ask them, call them as to why they left. And they're going to say, well, Brother Joe, he's a troublemaker or, you know, blah, blah, blah. They, they may have a lot of different reasons, but the, the, the statistics reveal that there are, what, 1,300, 1300 pastors a month that get, that get just uh, let, let go from their church without any apparent reason. That's a lot. I mean, you multiply that times 12, you know, that's, uh, I said, that's 13, almost 15,000 pastors lose their jobs without any real, real foundation for it. Because you got, you got all these stinking goats. You know? Uh, you, you got the tears that are, or, or that don't care about the church. You just have to, you just have to kind of navigate through all of that, Alex. I mean, you, you do, you just have to navigate through it. But if you have a mentality that you're just going to leave as soon as trouble raises its ugly head, and it will, you're not going to learn much. You probably don't need to be in the ministry. I'm just telling you. you, you, you know, I'm sure you may not believe me. But you, why would God want me here? So he can work on you. That's why. That's why. That's so that he can make you stronger. That's why he can make you the leader that he wants you to be. That you're not. That you're 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 not the leader yet. You can't ever go to a church for the first time, have your first church, and be a seasoned leader. Right. I mean that, that's all. That's only common sense. Uh, you, you have to learn the hard way. And the hard way is the best way. The best leaders are, have, have been through the fires. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego learned a lot more in the furnace than they ever did outside the furnace. <laughs> right? I mean, they really did. So you got to go through the fires of ministry at, at different times. I think uh, you rarely find God's wisdom always running from where He has placed you. You know, if, if you know God's wisdom is not going to just be pushing you out to some other place and then pushing you out from that place and pushing you out to somewhere else. I'm not saying that you can't ever leave somewhere. I'm not saying that at all, and I don't want you to feel that way. But if you have that mentality. And I'm going to go to this small church. I'm going to learn, and I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm, and then I'm going to, I'm going to find a bigger church later on. I don't think you need to be in the ministry because you want a career, not you're not. You, you you just want a career where you can be bigger. Bigger's not better. Trust me, bigger's not better. Uh, you find yourself moving around using the sermons that you developed for your last church so you're spending less and less time in the Word of God. It happens all the time. Guys have already developed series on John or Hebrews or First Peter or whatever it is and they go to another church and why study? They've already got all these messages that they think are wonderful that nobody's heard yet and so they just pull them out of their drawer and you know, print them off again or whatever they do, add a little bit to them, take a little bit away, and they're not growing. You only grow when you're in the Word. That's the only place that you're going to grow. That's when you're studying in, in the Word of God. Uh, I, you know, I think it'd almost be a good thing for a pastor when he went to another church. If he went to another church, just throw all his old sermons away. Put them in a box somewhere and never get them out. Just never get him out. So he didn't. He, so he's forced to study every week. He's he's forced to, to study. He's forcing himself. That's 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 uh, a lot of guys don't want to do that. So if in reality you rationalize away that you always need to be studying, your dependency on God is greatly weakened. You won't depend on God. I'm, I'm really just incredibly dependent on God to help me week after week. There's sometimes, uh, you know, I, 
I'll finish with my message. I always get through with my messages early. I mean, I, I don't I don't wait to the last minute to put something together or even a series and and then I go back and I read it and I'm just ah, I don't know I don't know about this Lord and uh, I remember several weeks ago I had one of those messages where I just went I just don't I don't think any, I don't think anybody get anything out of this and it was the one message that God used the most in my church in the last several months maybe the last six months it was the one where everybody prayed for me. You know, my heart was just out there somewhere. I mean, my heart got on the table. I mean, it was in the message, and it just it just got there. And uh, I, it wasn't in my notes. I didn't have anything like that in my notes, but the, the Holy Spirit just kind of showed up that morning in a different way, in a different way in me, and it had an impact on people that were there. And, and, and I, I don't even know how to explain it other than it happened. He just moved you over. He did. I don't know what he did. He just, he just said, Gary, I'll take care of this today. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he said, just hang, on, just hang on for a little bit. Uh, so just remember that God does, it, does nothing apart from His Word and His Spirit. So you have to stay close to both of them all the time. Here, here it is in the simplest terms. Love God and His Word. I've given this to you. You don't have to write down. Love God and His Word. Love God's work into which He's called you and love God's people. That's how you cultivate and develop a pastor's heart. All right, any questions on that before we get started in the next study? Is that helpful? I don't know that I've ever called you preacher maybe five times in 28 years. You know, I know that's a crazy thing, but I, I, I want to be called pastor. It's always been pastor. One of the, one of the kids called it creature gear. Yeah, creature gear. <laughs> <laughs> creature gear. <laughs> he called me creature gear. He didn't know what creature yep. was. Uh, yeah, I'm a creature, all right. Because <laughs> you've always been more of a, a teacher. Yeah, yeah. And, and I enjoy teaching a lot more than I enjoy preaching, if I can say it that way. I, I'm not... And, and I think the reason for that is because I have a congregation that I've been with for a long time and I know them and I'm not trying to get them saved. And I, I don't go in there and just rebuke them every Sunday. You know, what good is that going to do? It's not going to do them any good. It's certainly not going to do me any good. Um, I'm just going to keep teaching. So I'd be an encouragement to them. We might need that every once in a while. <laughs> well, every once in a while I, I will give it to you. <laughs> but... I don't, I don't plan on it. It's going to happen. All right, I'm giving you the next study. It's, uh, uh, I, don't, I do not want you to be reading it while I'm teaching it here. It's called Not Lording Over Your Flock. This is study 12, I think. I hope I got the numbers right. That may not have it right. I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 3. And this is kind of where we get this from. Um, 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 3 this is the next non-negotiable attribute of somebody that has been called into the ministry is that God does not want them to lord over their people I don't have much patience with guys like that I'm just telling you that I don't I think this is uh extremely serious this is it cannot be taken lightly under any circumstances if you go back through and you study this carefully uh, I'm also going to refer to lording over as I go through this I'm going to switch back and forth use the two the, the two terms I'm going to give you one's going to be lording o over and the other one is going to be spiritual abuse or, or, or abusing the ministry, you know, abusing the opportunities that God has actually given to you. Now, I, I want you to read along here with me. Uh, it's kind of interesting for me that the, 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 the contrast 
that it, that is here comes from verse 2 and verse 3, where he says, what I want you to do is to shepherd the flock of God, right? Which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Nor, as being lords, um, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So, if you, if you look at some of the key words in that passage, it, that should, they should jump off of the page to you. Shepherd, do not lord, be an example, right? Those are the words that just for me, just jump off the page when I when I read these uh, a couple of verses. The ESV says, "Not domineering over those in your charge." That's the way it puts in uh, verse three. The Amplified says, "Not domineering as arrogant, dictatorial, and overbearing persons over those in your charge." The actual word here for lording over, it's two words in English, but it's one word in the Greek. It's a Greek word, I'll write it up here. I, I can't, or I can hardly pronounce it. My word's in English, nevertheless in Greek. It's, uh, but it's, it's good to know. It's kata, K-Y, not kitty, K-Y-R-I-E-U-O. Did I get it wrong already? I did. K Y R I E U O. I think that's the way it's spelled. This is always a, a preposition part of the verb itself. As a preposition, if you understand anything about hermeneutics, the, the preposition that's always added to to a verb, what does it do for those of you who had a course on hermeneutics? It does what? Somebody tell me. It intensifies the word. It makes it stronger. It, it, it gives it a different meaning. It gives it a different nuance. And it carries the idea of having to control everything and finding it necessary to try and subject others to your control. I want to. I'm going to be a little bit. Uh, I'm not technical here, but I'm just going to go through some of the word studies here before I really get into kind of the application of it for for our lives. Uh, Doctor Zodiates, uh, that was what Doctor Strong said. That you just have to control everything. You, they find it. You you find it necessary to to subjugate people. To your control, Dr. Zodiati says it means by implication to get the mastery over, to overpower, to subdue. Boy, we've had some examples of that in the, the years past here. What was the guy that was out in Washington? What was his name? Jim Jones. No, no, no. 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 Get what his name was. Um, I'll think of it in a minute. Um, it just, he got, I mean, he was, he would get into meetings with his staff people and just curse at them, and just dominate. I mean, just, is it Hiles Anderson? No, no, no. no. Um, you'd know it funny if I told you. Uh, but at my age, I can't remember all that. Uh, th th this is not good to, to, to get mastery over people. I, I don't want to get mastery over my co congregation. I'm not interested in that. I want them to enjoy their Christian life, to live it out uh, personally, to live it out uh, with freedom and, and to exercise their gifts and their, you know, if they have a calling on their life, whatever it may be, to do it with joy. This is not a good picture at all. It's of doing people. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. I wouldn't know how to subdue somebody. It's a very negative word because it identifies what is so often the prevailing attitude of many pastors in their, their position. It's the idea of subduing. 
of overpowering people, uh, we'll, we'll see how they do that here in just a minute, of overcoming and suppressing other people because of some silly notion that they have because of their immaturity about the authority that they possess because they're the pastor of the church. They, they, they're the pastor, and so they think they, they have this kind of, this unique spiritual authority over people. I, don't, I certainly don't see that from this verse uh, and, and, and plenty of other verses that, that we could look at. Uh, but this is exactly what you do not want to do or to become, to be somebody who lords over those who are entrusted to you. Once you go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll keep referring back to verse 3 here in chapter 5 of Peter, but uh, uh, you don't have to stay there. I, I, I want you to look at 1 Peter 3, 3 and Titus, I think it's 1-7, uh, as we go through this. These are just the qualifications for elders or overseers or bishops or whatever you want to call them. Uh, in the New Testament, I call them leaders, servant leaders. I think that's a, a good way to, to understand what Paul is trying to say here. And the New Testament writers, especially Paul, he was, he was uniquely aware of the, he was uniquely aware of the spiritual abuse that was prevalent in churches already. Right? So the Lord has given him a whole list of, of, of attributes that he wants, that he wants uh, uh, his, his leaders to have that are the qualifications for spiritual leaders in a church setting. This is very important. Look at verse 3. This is just some of, uh, of the... Uh, qualifications not given to one not violent now now I that that's probably the key word and I'll go over that as much as I go over any of the other words because it is it carries with it a uh, a very I'm, I'm getting warm here excuse me uh, it carries with it a very it has a, of all the words, it, it has the strongest meaning, but it's not talking about physically being abusive, all right? And I'll, I'll explain that to you as we go through here. But the words that if I were, if, you know, that you could underline would be not violent, uh, and it says not greed for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. If you turn over to, we're just trying to get a list here. If you turn over to Titus chapter 1, verse 7, it gives us the same qualifications, but it says, For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self willed, not quick tempered, not given to wine. And then he repeats the same thing he said in, in 1 Timothy 3, not given to one, not violent, and not greedy for money. So he's actually repeated th that phrase uh, of not being violent. So here's, here are the words that, that you just cannot ignore. A pastor, uh, I'll just call it a pastor, cannot be, cannot be violent. He cannot be quarrelsome. He cannot be self-willed. He cannot be quick-tempered. You can't just get mad at people. You, you can't just break down and just get mad. Speak your mind. Be ugly. Say things that you'll regret. You know. Uh, you can't be self-willed. Just got to have your way. You got to have it. It's my way or the highway. You, you can't be arguing and quarreling with people all the time. And. It can't be violent. Now, the actual word for violent, I know some of you have computers, and if you looked it up, you would, it's a kind of all-encompassing word. It carries the idea, I have to use this because I can't remember all this stuff, somebody who uses very upbraiding language. 
It means somebody that is contentious, that they're arguing, that they're always quarreling. They're always contending. You cannot be that way in the ministry. You, you, you have to back off when that begins to happen. Somebody's going to say, well, sometimes you just have to defend yourself. Well, well go ahead. But you've got to learn how not to just quarrel with people, not to fight with people, you know, just to defer at times if you have to. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're compromising, it just means that you're deferring, right? You have to do that in your marriage all the time, right? It doesn't mean that you're compromising, it just, you just have to do, you need to defer, you need to learn how to do that. Compromising, that's not a bad thing, right? I mean, even in a marriage, what, what's the matter with using the word compromise? There's nothing wrong with it. Oh. Uh, Maybe some people don't like to say they're compromising. But... You don't want to compromise the truth. No. But sometimes you, there are plenty of gray areas that you may have to make some adjustments in. And mm -hmm. you, you, just, you just have to defer. I mean, you know, you can compromise. And that's, that's, that's part of being a good leader. You know, you're not quarrelsome, you're not arguing, you're not contending about every little thing that happens. Uh, upbraiding language um, is what uh, Zodiates called it. That was part of his definition. He said it carries the idea of very upbraiding language. And upbraiding language means that the person is scolding people, that he's reprimanding them, that he's rebuking them all the time. Man, that's the last thing I want to be doing, is running around reprimanding everybody in my congregation, rebuking them, reproving them for whatever, for whatever reason, you know. Uh, man, you left the lights on. What's a big deal? It costs us, what, 40 cents overnight? <laughs> you know, I mean, honestly, I mean, we, we, we find the most ridiculous things to, to, to kind of upbraid people about. Uh... If you've ever used the Lunida Greek lexicon, it says, now he, he uses another big word, and I'll tell you what that means. It says that they are pugnacious, demanding, and a bully. Where pug, pugnacious means that they are aggressive, confrontational, argumentative, contentious. So then when you you take all of these words here, I mean, demanding, a bully, aggressive, confrontational, argumentative, contentious, somebody that's always quarreling, and then you add to that, that that's the idea of being violent. You're just somebody that nobody else can get along with. You just have that personality, you have that... that Sergeant in the Army personality, whatever they call that. I don't even know what type that is. I could care less. But I can recognize it. You know, when you get around somebody, it's hard-headed, doesn't know how to defer, doesn't want to, is not going to, is going to argue about everything until he gets his way. God says, you, I mean, he says, we've read it twice here. It said it the same way. You cannot have that quality in your life. You're lording over your people when you're like that. Arguing with them, quarreling with them, demanding. Uh, and then you had the idea of being self-willed and quick-tempered and quarrelsome. It does not take long to understand that Paul did not have any respect for the servant leaders that operated this way in a church setting. And neither would you. Or neither should you, right? This is what you do not want to be. In fact, God says, if this is a quality of your life, that you are disqualified. You're disqualified from being a servant leader. You cannot have that quality in your life and be a leader in a New Testament church. You might force yourself on the church, but you're, you're no leader. You're no elder. You're no bishop. You're no whatever. Uh, simply stated, it's just forbidden. I mean, this is a very, very strong word. 
You go back, you can study it on your own in an area that every pastor needs to get right before they ever enter the ministry. Some people are that way before they enter the ministry and they just take it right on in with them. They think that that's kind of the way that you lead, you know, that strong, kind of demanding, we're going to push this through, we have an agenda, I'm a vision caster, we're going to lay it out here on the table, uh, I'm going to push this, you know, this is a Ezra Nehemiah building, we're going to preach on Ezra, we're going to preach on Nehemiah, uh, y'all have a grandson named Ezra, right? Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're going to build the wall, we're going to build the temple, we're, we're, going, we're going to do this. I was a part of that. And I'll tell you my story as we go through this, and we won't get to it tonight, I don't think. If I could say it in a different way, if you become a spiritually abusive pastor, then you are actually disqualified from being a pastor. And that one word, violent, you ought to figure out what it means. You ought to tattoo it onto your brain. You ought to tattoo it onto your brain. That if that's the personality that you take into the ministry, you need to be removed. You're not qualified. You're, God disqualifies you by Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3. You're disqualified. If that's... If that's the way that you are. The one word that stands out to me in all of these qualifying words, I think it's in, let me see if I can get it. In chapter 3, uh, uh, verse 3, it says, not given to one, not violent, not greedy for money, but, every time I get to the word but, it's a big deal to me, hermeneutically, but gentle. Everybody see that? You have to be gentle. I have never, ever, one time in 17 years of going to Romania, I have never seen one shepherd out of the hundreds, maybe thousands of shepherds that I have seen beat a sheep. They just stand out there and kind of guard, guard the flock. Make sure they're not wandering off somewhere. They got these big old sheep dogs. You don't want to get near the sheep dogs. Sheep dogs are really pretty dangerous dogs. They really are. You can't get near them. I mean, if they see you kind of walking up, I mean, they have some big, big sheep dogs. And they will not let you even get near the sheep. So this is a word that has many nuances. I went out and did some study on the word gentle as it was used here in this particular, in this verse here about being gentle. And it is associated with uh, characteristics such as being reasonable. Huh. Imagine that, just being reasonable. Considerate, being forbearing, being peaceable, being merciful, having a gentle toleration of other people, even if there is a justification for intolerance. You still tolerate them. You know, you're gentle. Um, it implies the example of Christ that someone is able to exert restraint. Can you imagine the restraint that Jesus had when we read about him standing before Pilate and Herod and, you know, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and all those people that wanted to kill him? He just had amazing restraint. I think it's unfortunate that young men who enter into the ministry without much experience often have the idea that controlling others is equated with leading others. Well, that's not accurate at all. 
That's not accurate at all. In fact, that's the very opposite. Leading is the very opposite. What someone who is a true leader does is that they influence people. If you go back and you look at the definitions of, of, of how these men have, have put this, defined this word, they have said that you lead by example. So you have to have that self-control. <clears throat> control others. That's right. That's a, that's, a, that's a good way of saying it. You're the one that has to be under control. And if you're under control, you're not going to be controlling. So uh, you, you influence people. You influence them by example, not control people, by lording over them. Here's what you always want to keep in mind. You've got to write this down. This is important. A leader who is a controlling leader, who just has to control everything, every decision has got to flow through him. You don't have to write all those words down. But just a, a controlling, uh, somebody who is a controlling leader always creates a very... He always creates a very dysfunctional church culture. Always. Always. The church is not designed to be controlled by one person. It's not your church. It's not my church to begin with. It's God's church. And He has set up the organizational structure of a church to be with a multiplicity of godly men who, who lead the church. And these men can do this by uh, intimidating people in whatever way they can. I'll give you some of those a little bit later. It can be by their personality. Uh, some men are really powerfully articulate. My wife and I went to a church with somebody that uh, for about 12 years that had a golden tongue. I mean, uh, I mean, it was, it was, it was bad. It was, uh, it was just bad because he thought what he was saying was good and it was really bad. But he had a way of convincing you that it was good. And, but you look at his life and you say, no, there's something missing here. There's something strategically missing. It kind of sounds good, but it doesn't look good. And he'd use his tongue to control people. It could be by, uh, by their education. Some guys have a domineering leadership style, right? They're very dominant. They're going to dominate. They're going to control. They want to control everything. Uh, everything has to funnel through them personally. In, in other words, they're not willing to give people responsibility and let them go do their job. They don't know how to delegate anything. They wouldn't know how to delegate somebody to go take care of the, making sure the, to, uh, the, the toilet paper's in the bathroom. You know, they, they just, they're going to be asking them questions about it. Just let them go do it. You know, I mean, if you give somebody responsibility, let them, let them fail. I, I think that's a good thing. Let, let them fail. What if they don't do it the way that you want them to do it? No big deal. Are these um, character flaws or characteristics of people, are they already there and they're enhanced by the power of being the pastor or does the power of being the pastor kind of overcome them hmm. and they... Probably both. Go. It's probably a combination of both. Uh, uh, there's a lot of books that are written about uh, how... What's the what's the term? I'm looking for a specific term. It says that it has to do with power. That power when you give people power, it it actually destroys them. You know, power corrupts, or yeah, something, yeah, or yeah. absolutely corrupts, right. or something. Like yeah, that. yeah, something like that. It's like power corrupts. That's uh, huh. Good morals. Well, it just it's the idea that when somebody gets power, it they, they it, it corrupts them. We see that all the time in government. 
I think it's when they get absolute power, it absolutely it corrupts. corrupts. Yeah, that's the way it says. When you have absolute power, it corrupts absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, thank you, James. I need all the help I can get. <laughs> um, Me too. No, I do. I need. I need it. So, uh, uh, it, it, you just have to give people responsibility and let them go do their job. I, th I, I bet the last thing that uh, Jeremy wants is for his pastor to come walking into his office every day and give him a, a briefing on on how you handle this, uh, Jeremy. Or you know, it's just. It's kind of nonsense, really, to treat people that way. Uh, you, you want to let them do what what you've asked them to do. But that's a that's that's not controlling them. It's it's giving them guidance. If if they come to you and they want guidance, give it to them. But don't make it a demand. You know, don't make it a, a test that they they have to pass. You know. Yeah. Question, Gary. You yes. talk about <clears throat> some of you that had a golden tongue. Mm -hmm. For a specific example, how do you combat the leader that hides snide, disparaging comments and humor, and they are a sitting leader in the church? How do you combat it? Yeah. Obviously, I'm not saying that like, go and confront the person and just have an all argument, but obviously, there's a way to address it, head it off. I mean, because it. I have watched those comments really kind of tear people down. Yep. Uh, I think that happens all the time. Uh, and we'll talk more about that as we go through here, but just to kind of address that from my perspective is that, is that a lot of times leaders surround themselves with their groupies. If they're yes, ma'am. Right. No. And it makes it even more dis difficult to get into that kind of inner circle. It could be some deacons, it could be, you know, you could have ten deacons in a church and about three or four of them sort of surround the pastor or whoever, and they're not going to let them get, you know, they're going to let them say whatever they want to say and sort of protect them. And it's a challenge. It's, it's, I don't have a, just a real simple answer for that. Uh, I would say, I would always say to you, I would always say to you that you go to somebody in private and you, you speak to them in, in private. Um, um, I, I, I don't mind, I don't mind saying this out, out, out loud, I don't mind saying it on video. I, I, uh, uh, two of the men in this room approached me about my sermons being too long. And I, I took it to heart. You know, I, it, at first it kind of stung a little bit, but uh, uh, I, I think I think the more I thought about it, the, the the they were right, and I had to make an adjustment. But everybody's not going to be like that. I'm still down to just an hour and fifteen minutes, so, and I'm not sure that I can stay away from an hour and a half. Huh? Nobody's less than about an hour and fifteen. I know. I know. So. <laughs> Uh, it's two hours and fifteen minutes, <laughs> and it gets him. So, but you know, I, 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 but every leader's not going to be like that. Every, every leader's not going to 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 have that mentality. And the last thing I want to do is to be making snide remarks about the men that that have surrounded me, that love me, and I know that I know that what James and and. Uh, uh, Chris said to me, "We're not out of." It wasn't a hatred. No, it was no, no, no. They right. was no. They uh, they they knew it was counterproductive if we had visitors, and it was. I mean, it, and it will be. So I just said I have to make an adjustment. I'm, I'm going to. I had six pages of notes. I'm down to four, and I still have some trouble. You know, but. Uh, so what uh, if what if. In his situation, the person doesn't receive that one-on-one -on -one feedback well. Not, the person doesn't receive it, has got some lessons to learn. Yeah, you can't control that. You can only do what's right for you. You can go to him in private, you know. James came to me in private, and Chris came to me in private. Separately, they got a You had said, you're just wrong. Huh? You had said to them, you're just wrong. 
uh, and just kind of dismiss them, that would have made them, it would have been awkward. I, I, I could have said that in some way. I mean, I could have communicated that just by the tone of my voice or my disappointment or, you know, but but after 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 thinking about it, I, I felt like they were right. And, but in and, saying something to somebody, huh? in saying something to somebody, you always run the risk. Of absolutely, coming back in your absolutely. not in your favor. Absolutely, especially for a pastor that lords over his flock, that feels like he can't be wrong. Uh, I've always, I've told you a story about the time I got. I'll tell it again, just, just to reemphasize that I got really frustrated in my congregation one Sunday morning. I thought everybody was asleep. I just shut the service down about halfway through my message and said, I'm done. And I, I said a prayer and went off the stage <laughs> and went into my study. I was that frustrated with, I had studied hard and I didn't think anybody was listening. And this is a long time ago. I'll get out. I was like, huh? Literally. Yeah. You didn't appreciate me doing that, did you? That was kind of shocking. <laughs> yeah, it is shocking. Were you surprised when he did it? Um, yes. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was surprised I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've never done it before. You know, I said, I'm going to try to see how this works. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't get everybody's attention. But I don't want to ever do that again. And, and one of the elders came in and, uh, and, and gently reproved me. And it was, uh, and I, I received it immediately, and I went back to the church and, and uh, asked him to forgive me. I said, this will not happen again. <laughs> so. Um, and some may not receive it immediately. They have to think hmm. and accept it. Yeah. And then let you know. So you might not get a response you want right in the beginning. Well, I think the answer to Robbie's question, though, is that, is that, you have to recognize the source that you may not, that you may be going into a hostile environment, uh, a hostile circumstance where somebody's not really going to receive what you have to say to them. So does that mean you're Old Testament and treat them like Goliath and your David? About what? <laughs> I'm joking. No, no. I'm joking. No, I would just say that you have to, you just have to, Pray for him. Right, you have to pray for them, but you, you've got to do what's right on your part. And if, if, especially if you know that they are attacking specific people, and you know who those people are in your congregation. This, that's not right. No. You know, that's not right. That's, that's lording over your flock. It doesn't have to be the preacher. It can be the, the head deacon. It can be one of the elders. It can be anybody that's in a position of leadership. Uh, and somebody needs to address that with them. If, if it takes a little bit of courage to jump out there and do that, I think, uh, because you don't want to. You don't want to be the strife maker in your church, but you're not the one creating the strife. You're the one trying to, yeah, to, 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 to stop it happen. from happening. Because everybody knows what the snide remarks mm -hmm. are. Everybody knows what somebody's talking about. There, there's no, there, there, there's no mystery with words. You know, it's, it's not like they're trying to hide something. It's the idea that they actually said it, and it was real, and it, it, it can hurt people. And uh, you know, I, I, I just want to say that it would be difficult for me. In, a, in, in just in the congregation to sit under that kind of ministry for a long time. I sat under it for too long. And it just about, I, I cannot tell you the impact it had on me. I learned so much from it that I don't, I, but I don't ever have to go through it again. Uh, is to sit under the ministry of somebody that doesn't know how to control their emotions and their words, especially in a public setting. Oh, and it's always public. It's never properly stated. Yeah, I can imagine. So, but you know, you go to that, you go to it, like, you know, I, I could. I was watching some, so you're talking about that. But I could tell that hurt. Not that you don't appreciate it, but you know, but hey, that hurt that person. Right. And then on the at least on the initial contact, that hey, that you know, that hurt their feelings. They they kind of soft out of here. 
Yeah. I, and I, then if it have, continues, like, you know, you heard him again. I really don't, you know, I, I, that's not very kind of you. I don't, I, I don't appreciate it. You know, that kind of thing. I don't and like build. Yeah. I don't like confrontation, but I had to do that twice with a pastor in Wisconsin. He was just calling people out from the pulpit, and everybody knew who he was talking about every time. And he just kept doing it, and I felt like I had to approach him and say, you can't do that. You know, I approached him very sheepishly, mm -hmm. respectfully, and said, you know, if you've got a problem with him, you're supposed to go to right. him. In. Well, and I have a lot of this person on one occasion. I mean, I was having like too much detail. Like oh, yeah. I, said, oh, I don't want any detail. Yeah, but like I said, it's just, it's very specific comments. It's snideful, mm -hmm. but it's hidden in humor. And so as soon as the comments made, it's chuckled off like, oh, well, that was supposed to be funny. But you can watch the people that that comment was directly spoken to, and you watch the demeanor change in future meetings and everything mm -hmm. else. Like you see the effect that it has. But maybe the person doesn't think of it that way. Like, they just think. They yeah, somebody's think making funny, snide remarks. They know, know. they know what, exactly what they're doing. Mm -hmm. This person knows. Hands down. Don't you think that, and I was listening to, to somebody talk about it the, the other day. Other people. That is there. We have they don't become, hang on, hang on, hang on, become confused in the church when we hear people say that we're Christian, that automatically means that you have to be nice all the time. You don't have to be nice to somebody just because you're a Christian. I'm not saying that you demean somebody or, or, or go that route, but if somebody is insulting you or somebody else and you hear it or you know what's going on, you can go be unfriendly. You're welcome, but, defend, defend. but say I, something I about it. You don't sit back and just say, well, I'm a Christian. I'm just going to have to be nice about it all the time. I don't, I don't think that's right. I don't think Jesus I, I think I think well, we're going to look at a key verse, and in, in it's a part of this study. In First Peter chapter two, is that when Jesus was reviled, he didn't revile back. When he was threatened, he didn't threaten back. He just committed himself to his Father. That's what it. That's what it says. That's right? what we want. I, I mean, that's that, that's that's what we want to happen. I'll read it to you. Just 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 hang on. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to him who judges righteously. So he just trusted the Father to take care of it. Well, he did. He, he did. He, I mean, they they spit on him. They they did all kinds of things to him, and he he kept. He, I mean, he was able to say when he got to the cross, "Father, I ask you to forgive these people, for they don't they don't even know what they're doing." Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Alex, I don't mean to be uh, argumentative. I, I would, I would completely disagree with that position. I think there are times when you just have to be. My, my illustration is that you have to be a sponge. A sponge just absorbs just the impact, and then it comes back, right? And uh, I, I, I think I have to be gracious all the time. Somebody can insult me, and uh, the, the hardest thing would be is, is that if they were insulting my wife, or if they were insulting the, the godly men in my church or something, or women. I, I, would, I, I would want to be defensive, but I'm not going to just turn, I don't want to be like them. I want my words to be soft and gentle and gracious and kind and not, and not argumentative and not all these other words that we used about being violent. That's what it means to be a pastor and you have to learn that lesson. And the only way that that can happen is that you have to be treated exactly like you're talking about. That's the only way that you're going to learn how to respond the way that God wants you to respond. That's the only way. That's, that's the only way. You, you can't just read a book and that happened because when it happens, you have emotions that you don't get out of the book. All you have are feelings that just start to come up and about, I'm, I'd like to just knock this guy's teeth out. But that's not what God wants you to do. You know that's a test when that happens. 
I guarantee it's a test. That's not going to fail. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a test. Well, if you fail it and you keep failing it, you, you just keep getting the same test over and over. Or more. I failed my passenger endorsement the day it passes the second time. I'm all right. I'm joking. You, you gotta. You, you just have to. You just have to bear up under the pressure sometimes. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not saying don't stand up for truth or anything like that. You got this. You, you have to stand up. I'm saying even if I have to stand up for the truth, that I'm going to do it in the right demeanor. Right. Right. I'm not going to be violent. Right. I'm not going to get mad, I'm not going to get angry, I'm not going to curse at somebody, I'm not going to threaten them, I'm not going to be contentious, I'm not going to just sit there and quarrel and debate and argue yes, yes. and all of that. That's what these verses are saying. The person that's going to ultimately lord over their flock, that's the way that they're going to be. They, they are the people that are going to actually abuse that opportunity to become Christ-like. You'll have much, a much greater impact on the people that you're going through that with, if I can call it that way, if you'll do the right thing. You don't want to become like them. You want to become like Christ. Amen. There are times when Jesus, uh, Matthew 23, I have to say, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. He says it seven times, woe to you. I mean, he just, he, 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 he knocks them down. I mean, he's like bowling balls, and he just, he bowls them straight down. He called them just a pack of wolves, you know. Uh, and those are the only people that he ever really got angry with were the religious leaders. But other people? And Peter. Well, he didn't really... He wasn't, he, was, he wasn't mad at Peter. He was... He told Peter to get behind him. He said, get behind me, Satan. But he told Peter later on, he said, he said, look, Peter, this is right at the end of his ministry. He said, he says, Satan wants to sift you like wheat, but it'll be okay. I got you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Peter became, after Jesus was resurrected, the greatest preacher on the planet at that time. You know, I'd like to preach a sermon where 3,000 people got saved. <laughs> I think that may be more people than got saved during the ministry of Christ the whole time under his preaching. I think there's a good chance for that. I think a lot of theologians believe that. Just that one day when the Holy Spirit came, and, and I'm, I'm sure that the Holy Spirit filled Christ, uh, or, 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 or indwelt Christ. Uh, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ, but um, but Peter, I mean, they went to jail. They singing in jail. <laughs> you know, the doors open. That they 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 were bold from that point on, uh, and uh, but they they ultimately had to suffer. So. All right, that's all the time that we have. We, we have run out of time. All right, well let's uh, close, James. You want to close for us? And we'll start the next class. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you would use these lessons to help us in the future to remember these things and, and to I pray that you'd give us all endurance and uh, just help us to stand for what's right and, and stand where you have put, in a, put us, Lord, uh, whether people are for us or against us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.